Washington, D.C. for coming out tonight. <laughs> the beautiful and historic Lincoln Theater. Um, welcome, D.C., welcome, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, all our friends here. Um, we're so happy to be with you. Um, first of all, I would like, if you will, to join me on a trip back in time. <laughs> to the year 2000, it was the, it was the autumn of the year. And uh, I was going out that night to a place that many of us went nearly every weekend in those times um, in, in L.A. And that was to a wild, big, drunken house party at Melissa McCarthy's place. <laughs> like we did. And um, on this one particular or night at this one particular party, I looked across the room and I saw this beautiful young woman. And I had I'd seen her before in, in photos and on TV and in, in a movie or two, but I had never seen her in real life. And I knew she was on this new show with my friend Melissa and some other friends of mine. And, but in person, I was just dazzled by her. Not romantically, sadly, or sexually, but I mean, <laughs> wink. <laughs> but as just this amazing human being. And I went over and introduced myself, and we started talking. And I was even more charmed and delighted and dazzled by her humor and her, her, you know, her wit and her intelligence. And then as we realized we were separated at birth and were dear friends, <laughs> I became more and more dazzled by her true beauty, beauty inside and out and her true generosity of spirit and heart. So when I tell you guys, <laughs> I speak from experience when I tell you that prepare to be dazzled when I bring out Washington, D.C. girl, Langley High School's own <laughs>
works. Sneak up on someone who tried to lick their whole face. <laughs> and and um, I, I had played that game with her, and um, then I had the COVID, so I couldn't. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Um, and so I, I had to cancel that, and so when the paperback was coming out, it, I thought it would be really fun, and this has become this, I don't know, we can't, the book came out like a year ago, so it can't really be a book tour anymore, but hey, we're all here. <laughs> and it's become this like beautiful reason to get together and to uh, meet people and um, to hang with you, so it's been really fun, so thank yeah, you. We're having a great time. Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, what brought you to writing, we'll, we'll start with the novel, Sunday, Sunday, maybe, and then we'll go to the books of uh, the collection of essays and tell us about how you first got uh, started on that novel. Well, I think part of it was I had time for the first time in, since almost since I had started trying to work as an actor and then and then working as an actor, it was so much hustle and so many jobs and so much um, work that... 14 hour days of non-stop work. Well, Gilmore Girls, but <laughs> if you are uh, familiar, <laughs> part of the magic of the show and part of the reason I think it endures is it, it had such an unusual um, language to it and, and was shot in, in a way where we do these very long walk and talks. My cousins used to call me and be like, why are you circling the gazebo again? <laughs> <laughs> But, um, and so we have these long tracking shots, sometimes with a steady cam, which is basically one camera person walking backwards. And um, a lot of things can happen in a 10 page scene with a person walking backwards. Um, if a bird flies, if the you know, airplane noise is, comes, if somebody forgets a line, um, you, you do it again. So we would have these long days to get these long takes that um, were very exhilarating once you got them. But, I was in my dressing room at Parenthood one day, and, anyone? Yep. And, <laughs> um, um, and uh, I was done with work at like three o'clock in the afternoon, and that was so unusual, and that it might have been, I'm sure it wasn't exactly, but it felt like one of the first moments where I thought, how did I get here, kind of, and they, you know, one of the things, like if you're on a press line or something, people always ask me, is like, how'd you know when you made it? No one ever knows that, like you don't, I don't think that's a feeling anybody has um, for a very long time. As an actor, you're used to a very nomadic life and thinking of what's next, and it's very hard to be in the moment and recognize where you are. And it seemed insane to me in, in that on that day. I thought, what was I even thinking? I mean, yes, I was Dolly and Hello Dolly, like in high school. <laughs> <laughs> but as somebody said to me when I moved to LA and I said, I was Dolly and Hello Dolly, and they were like, everybody here was Dolly and Hello Dolly. <laughs> so, I wasn't. <laughs> Get there. Here. I'll get there. Um, <laughs> the Langley High School casting. <laughs> yeah, it's She's still scouting. <laughs> um, so I just thought it was such a crazy thing. It literally was. I was in a couple of plays and I just wanted to be an actor. And I went to New York and I started sort of in, in these small ways. And, and then I got something that led to something. And anyway, I was in at work that day and I connected to whatever that kind of um, ambition had been. And I didn't want to write, at that point, anything autobiographical. I didn't want to write nonfiction, although that's become the thing I really enjoy writing. Um, and so I began it as, as fiction, and, um, and, and then it was really fun. It sort of like sparked the young child reader in me, where I, I, I got to play all the characters. I'm the, you know, I can invent all the dialogue and it was just really fun. So then how, what then led you to doing the essays? In the first book or this one? Um, well by that time, when we came back to do the Netflix uh, movies, which was such a, an incredible experience, just the thought of, it, it would be like, 
whatever your biggest experience is of high school or college or um, some job that you look back and think, gosh, if I only knew now what I didn't know then, you know, how would it have been different? Wouldn't it be fun to go back and and kind of be appreciate something that is is happening in the moment that it's happening? And that to me gave bookends of of uh, like a sort of a memoir that could make sense, which is here I got to do this thing, and this is what it was like at the time, and then I got to come back and do it, and here's all of what happened kind of between those two times, and here's a little bit of you know what led up to getting to do it in the first place. And I found that I really like the essay form because the way it comes to me is, is almost a title, like an idea, and then I think on it for a while, and I think, is that something kind of big enough that would be relatable to you, that I can share something um, in, a, in a way that makes it a beginning, middle, and end? Right, yes, and we still come up with titles yes. constantly, all the time. <laughs> for, for, is that for an essay? Books yet to be written. Yeah, yes. a lot of them could be. Yes. I think they could be. Oh, we'll write about you next, don't worry. <laughs> um, so when you, in terms of your writing process, do you have one? <laughs> um, I and let me help you out. Is it different between the novel and the, the essay, the nonfiction work? Well, I wish it were different. I wish that when I first got the opportunity to publish the novel, I sat down with my editor, Jennifer E. Smith, who is a fantastic writer herself of YA and now some adult novels, and I said, look, Jen, I was an English major in college. I wrote my thesis on the word processor. Well, on the, I say computer, because nobody knows what the word processor is. <laughs> <laughs> on the thing that was in my room. But, and, and I turned it in, like, at the last second, you know, under the professor's door. And so that's me as a procrastinator and as a potentially as a writer. And she said, oh, okay. Um, well, just so you know, I was also an English major in college and I finished my thesis two weeks early and I lied about it because I didn't want people to think I was a nerd. And I was like, well, this is either going to be fantastic or, and it turned out to be very fantastic, but um, I think I do better when I'm most busy. That same gen came when we were doing A Year in the Life for Netflix and I, I was thinking. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep saying it so I get her to do it as a book. Um, and I'd be between. She'd never really come to set before, and she thought it was all kind of, you know, fascinating. And I'd be writing on my laptop. At this point, I had a laptop, and um, and they'd be like, "And we are rolling." And I'd be like, <laughs> you know, and they'd be like, "And." Action. And I'd be like, hurry, why don't you? <laughs> that's such a bad, that's such a line that would never be in Gilmore Girls. Hurry, <laughs> that's like the bad of the half hour version. But anyway. <laughs> Look at what she's doing again. She's so smart. <laughs> she loves to read. Anyway. So Jen and I went out after, and she was like, had tears in her eyes practically. She was like, are you going to get this done? Because the book was due, the book had to come out. When the show came out, otherwise it made no sense. Like, why am I doing a show about Gilmore Girls like months after Gilmore Girls came out? So we, you and we shot that like in the spring and it came out in the fall. That's crazy, yeah. dude. It's what they call in publishing a crash schedule. Doesn't that sound soothing? <laughs> Does that sound relaxing for everyone at the publisher? Um, yes. Well, they can and and the special um, panic at the time was. I think Michelle Obama's first book was coming out, and they were, they, it was something something to do with paper. Like, they were literally running out of paper because, <laughs> yes, she had so many, like, so many copies come out. I mean, maybe that, that doesn't sound true. <laughs> they were running out, what, huh? Were you publishers now? <laughs> they were running out of some thing that you used to make books. And, <laughs> Yeah. Every show is different, y'all. Yeah. You're lucky. So 
I just get it done, but it's not pretty. I wish it was better. And I feel so, I spoke at a college the other night. It was just like, people were like, what advice do you have? And I was like, don't do it like I do it. That's <laughs> <laughs> not what kids want to hear. But, um, <laughs> Lady, I gotta tell you, I've said this to you before in many contexts, you make everything look good. No matter what's going on. Here. things that are public and leave you up for criticism. I'm like, why don't I just go sailing or something that people just do that it doesn't like, you know, get a review in the New York Times or whatever. I don't know, but I don't know. Well, you've touched on this a little bit, but let's jump back to acting. How did you, any stories you want to share about when you first started out or what led you on your way to New York City? Um, and well, Southern Methodist University. <laughs> I, I went to, well, uh, in, in order, yeah, sorry. I think that um, the writing and the acting at all is a form of, of, obviously, of storytelling. And I always loved books as a kid. My dad would read to me every night, and I would, in my head, picture the story and all the characters and what they were doing. And that just led me, because I wasn't, and still am not, particularly, it, it, there was no sense of like, I wanted to be in front of people. Like it wasn't a, um, like it wasn't exhibitionism. It wasn't like, I, I don't know. I, I just wanted to tell stories. And, but I do remember there was like a talent show, maybe second grade or third grade. And there was a uh, commercial at the time for fake butter, like for margarine <laughs> or something. And the, and the, commercial, gosh, I've told this story about 50 times and it doesn't get shorter, I'm sorry. <laughs> there was a commercial for fake butter and Mother Nature finds out that the butter is fake and that it's margarine and she says, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. And I, I know, it's not that Some of us know. Anyone over 45 remembers that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, margarine. Um, having nothing to do with Butter, I was given that line in the show and I got a laugh. And I just the, the fun of like saying something in a way I would never say it, and the communication with the audience and just the kind of live experience was so intoxicating and it encompassed everything I loved, which was pretending and reading and writing and I don't know, it just made sense. And then I became one of those kids who was like in summer theater and, you know. Hello, Dolly. And so, oh, guys, don't make me keep talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, they, I had standing ovations every night. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were saying you got to SMU and then. I totally said that already. No, but then like the park, remember oh, you were like. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, prompting me on my life story. <laughs> like, no, no. That's why I'm here, darling. <laughs> no, that I went to grad school and I was like, my parts are smaller now. I'm not Dolly anymore. And like, I was, I had like, I was fifth banana at grad school because everyone was Dolly. So then you had to start over again, which I had found is endless. And maybe this applies to you in your career. It's never. Well, I think it's probably unique to the arts, which is you're always trying to get to the next level and then you think you've gotten there and no, no, there's more. And you have to keep kind of like proving yourself and keep redefining who you are and what you do. And, and both of us have been lucky enough to last a pretty long time, yeah. but. Thousands of years. Thousands and thousands of years. It feels like. Um, we're gonna jump now to directing because I was particularly fascinated by your essay, Red Hat, Blue Hat, in which you write about gearing up to direct an episode of what I like to call Mighty Ducks 2, What the Puck? <laughs> Mighty Ducks 2, still quacking. She hates these. She I will never these are stop not saying real them. Episodes. These are not real episodes. <laughs> And, you're, and you, the sage advice in this chapter given to you by your friend, the, the director, John Turtletaub. And can you talk about uh, or share any vital aspects of directing you learned while being an actor? Well, I think in the way I'm talking about when you spend a long time in this profession in particular, you begin to see how important everybody is and you begin to have a greater understanding of the whole and not just your piece in it. So on the one hand, when you hear 
actors or whoever being like, what I really want to do is direct. <laughs> it can kind of be like, oh boy. But it is, I think, kind of a natural progression to where you feel like, well, I now, I really, I've been here longer than anybody, like at, at watching how people do their jobs and understanding what a really good day is for all of us. And so I would like to be the person who helps facilitate that and um, and who kind of gets to set the tone. And so that's where the desire to direct came from, not from mad ambition, but just from <laughs> like, I understand what this is. And you know, sometimes I've worked with young filmmakers who have gone to film school, but they don't have the experience. And um, so I really love getting to work with the kids. And I also know the language of actors, which if, if I'm on a TV show, again, I probably know the character better than somebody said to me that being a director in television is like being invited to somebody else's house and having to cook dinner with only the ingredients they have and <laughs> what the meal is that they want. And so you're kind of there to facilitate. And um, I really loved it. It was really fun. I hope you'll do more of it because I think you're really good at it and you have a really, you know what I think. <laughs> well, they don't. Oh. <laughs> I want you to direct some more. It's that I think you should do it. And, and you're working with some screenwriting stuff too, right? Well, with this same editor, Jen, um, who's become a writing partner. Yeah, I think it's it's all to me part of the same thing. You know, it's just how how do you tell the story? And I really feel like I went to the school of as close to Amy Sherman Palladino will ever <laughs> teach a speech. Because you just, if you live with, first of all, the fact that we had the connection we had in order to end up working together at all was something I don't know that I'll ever have again. The experience I had when I got that script was like, it was like falling in love across a crowded room. Like I was like, oh, I know you, I know you, and I, I am this, and I don't want anybody else to get this. Ever. <laughs> and but it was like hearing a song, but you feel like you've heard it before. Like it was so familiar, even though it was brand new. And and I lived with that language in my body, performing it, but reading it and memorizing it, and and hearing that music, and I will never be half the writer she is, but it, it gave me an ear, or it helped hone my ear for what feels funny to me, or what feels authentic, and so I'm just lucky to have had that experience. It's an incredible experience. Yeah. yeah. That's it, that's all I have. <laughs> um, okay, jumping right along, back to this book. There's a chapter about a dear friend of ours. Her name is Old Lady Jackson. I don't know if you've read it yet. And I'm well acquainted with Old Lady Jackson and her pal, Uncle Peapaw Pancake. And they really love this early dinner time now. It's earlier every year. We did, Sam and I did go to dinner one day at four. <laughs> it was six and then it got to five. And one day you texted me, you're like, Can I, would you go for 3.30? No. <laughs> like no, we called it at four because we went okay. to dinner at four. Okay. And in LA especially, the sun is beating down. On it. I, was like, I was like, we still have to be up for like seven more hours. And then we can like go to a respectable bedtime. So we were like, okay, five. Fine. So, to talk a little about the origin story of Old Lady Jackson, I, uh, if for those of you who don't know, me. this is, it's so silly, but Old Lady Jackson is a character in some of my books, and, and, it, and she, um, she was born uh, <laughs> on Parenthood, where I was suddenly working with, because Alexis and I were close enough in age that we at least understood, you know, I was like, James Taylor? And she was like, I guess. I don't know. Like, so we at least sort of understood the same references. And then I'm on Parenthood with younger kids, and they were so cool, especially my kids, May and Miles, who are still two of my best friends. Yes. We really had a bond, and I 
really want their approval. And, and but like I was sort of, which is by the way the least cool mom thing you could possibly do. But so I'd start saying something to them that I, you know, giving them advice or whatever. But I didn't want to lose my obvious cool. So I'd be like, I mean. I don't care if you get another tattoo, but old lady Jackson over here thinks you have one too many. <laughs> and they saw through it right away. <laughs> and, and they'd be like, oh, does old lady Jackson think we shouldn't stay out late? And I was like, no, no. So it just became, and then now May like signs her notes like OLJ Jr. Like it's just become this. Like, birthday, May brought the cookie cake. It just said, happy birthday, old lady Jackson. <laughs> so it's just, she's become this like, person in her lives. And so in this book, which is just ridiculous, but I just wrote her a little monologue. And I love her. I want to read a little bit from this, um, which if I could find it, I swear that I, here it is. Now, they were giggling at Charlotte. This is the serious part, okay? I think this, this is a beautiful, like, passage, and I just, it really touched me. <clears throat> it's very useful to always have a friend who is much older and one who is much younger. The older friend will remind you what there is to look forward to, and the younger friend will keep you telling your stories over again so you'll remember not to forget them. An older friend will tell you you have plenty of time yet, and a younger friend will make you forget time altogether, because when you're with them, you'll feel, even for a moment, that you're the exact same age. I just think that's so beautiful, honey. It's so true. <laughs> I get older, I know no one else is getting older, but I am getting older, and it just hits home even harder. Well, it's truly one of the benefits of being part of these pretend families, in addition to the benefit of, of your real family, is I'm, I keep being exposed to younger and older people of different experiences, and, and these friendships take on they're the family that you're pretending to be, but also, like, Kelly Bishop who played my mom on <laughs> is such an important person in my life, and it's it feels, uh, to call her my friend, almost, I'm like, but, she, you know, I just was at her 80th birthday, and, and, uh, and she's so fantastic, and she's so, she was, like, leaving the next day to go do an episode of Shrinking. I'm like, what? Well, it's like, she won't stop. And, and I, and she was just such an important person in my life. She was so supportive of me and so um, flattering to me and, and, uh, and, and gave you advice. And gave me a lot of advice. Then I'd tell her like a story of some guy or whatever, and she'd be like, well, he sounds horrible. Don't call him back. <laughs> like, right? But she, I mean, she's, you know, she started as a dancer. She was in the original cast of A Chorus Line on Broadway, for which, yes, for which she won the Tony and um, playing Sheila, which is uh, Everything Was Beautiful at the Ballet. Kelly, by the way, who has a book coming out <laughs> called The Third Gilmore Girl, which indeed she is, and um, I'm scared of what's in it. <laughs> Because she has no filter. And I was like, Kelly, you realize people were gonna read. I mean, I don't know, I don't know why I'm scared, but I I don't know, I don't know. But so I would I buy it. I yeah. Um but she oh you did? Oh, but she she you know, she was incredibly disciplined, she always knew every line, she was never tired, she never complained, and then if we were there till like two in the morning, you know, sometimes she'd be like you want to split a bag of Cheetos? Split a dainty with her like nails. Like, a bag of Cheetos. So she's just good fun. Can I tell my one of my Yeah, yeah. One of the first times we all hung out, or maybe not the first, I think we were in Unique's house in, in LA. And we were smoking cigarettes when we used to do that and drinking martinis when I used to do that. And I feel something on my leg, like on my ankle. And I think I had shorts on. And I looked down and uh, Kelly Bishop had slipped her pump off and was stroking my ankle with her toe. <laughs> <laughs> really, Kelly? Exciting! <laughs> She's fun. She's, I mean, she's Sheila from a chorus. Yeah. Um, 
I, w I wish I had had, when I was a young actor, your essay in this book, The Essay Actory Factory, to read when I was just starting out. Because you lay out everything so beautifully about what it's like to be an actor. What advice would you give, like, Lauren Graham in starting out in 95 or 96? Um, well, leaving her aside for the minute, <laughs> what I say to people now, when I was at the college the other night, yeah. is, I, I think no matter what you're doing, someone has done it before you, and it's just a fun and also useful project to become a student of whatever that is. There's so much memoir out there and so much um, documentary or whatever, but just like to, like when I came up, I was interested in actresses of the 20s and 30s and old movies, not just by way of what, what did this used to look like, and I have felt over the years that it's one of those things nobody tells you. Nobody tells you how to navigate pretty much anything, and nobody tells you, um, and I'm not sure why, I guess there's really no apprenticeship for this if you're not coming up in the theater. And I did, to some degree, come up in the theater as an uh, apprentice at Summerstock, but <laughs> what they had us do there was paint the fences and clean the bathrooms. So I was like, I am happy to do, I'm not happy, but I mean, I'll do this, but, I'm not learning how to be a better, you know, Corrine in the back of Oklahoma or whatever, but I guess you just learn by doing it, by just being around and, um, but so that, that essay I just thought, I, I have a couple of friends who are writers who then became showrunners who would come to me and say like, why, why does, simple things, like why does the day take so long and what, what should I tell the director and, and, and you know, just basic filmmaking, because people come at this from so many different, plenty of people don't, come up in the theater or come through film school or, or whatever. And so I was just trying to break it down in terms of like, if we were filming this audience, you would have shot where you could see everybody and then you might zero in on two people having a conversation. You'd have to do this person's side and this person's side and you have to light differently for both of those things and it all has to fit together. And we all know more than we used to about how things are made, um, but still, not everybody knows what that kind of, what those pieces are. And I found, I'm sure you did too, on TV and in movies, you just learned as you did it, like all right. the terms and everything, and it was kind of... Well, I remember in theater school, they'd be like, when, you, when you're in a movie or a TV show, you have to be quieter. I was like, eh, that's not, it's, it's not about being quieter, it's about scaling down for the, for the medium, but... Yes. Well, speaking of your early movie roles, you had my dream come true when you got to work with Dane Meryl Streep on One True Thing. Woo! And I, it's one of the first questions Meryl's I think I here tonight, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what was that experience like? Well, I was out of my mind. This is the other thing that, no, you can't, this, okay, so now I'll go back to what I would have told Lauren. What's your name? At, uh, Lauren Graham? Yeah. At, early, which is, you have to find a way to be, have your feet on the ground in these situations that are inherently very weird. And like doing a movie with Meryl Streep where you play Renee Zellweger's best friend, and it's like, your, that's your second movie. That was my second movie, I'm talking about me. And, um, I was just so nervous the whole time just to be around her and to, I didn't want to make a mistake, and, and Renee had just done Jerry Maguire, and people were like stopping on the street everywhere, being like, Ugh! and like, it's just a lot, and you have to both, as the person even to the side, find a way to stay rooted and, and real, and not take in some of that kind of ch chatter, even though, of course, it's really nice, everybody wants their work to be appreciated, but, so then at the premiere of the movie, I kind of made my way through, and. Um, and Meryl came up to me and she said, you know, I want to tell you, I'm going to give you a compliment, which is, as an actor, you're a very good listener. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> because I was still so nervous to be around her that, like, I was like, she's giving me a comp, which is not what good listeners say. <laughs> a good listener. So stuff like that, I just kind of never... I I'm here to help. If Sam was like Jimmy Fallon, can you imagine? And like he'd be like, hey, um, Brad Pitt, you forgot the part about me. <laughs> so, okay, on this movie, I came to work.
work one morning, and it was it was a wintertime shoot in New Jersey, and it was we were in an actual house. It was very drafty, and the movie is about Meryl's character getting sick, and it had a very heavy kind of the atmosphere. Um, you know, was was heavy because of the subject matter, and we're there at five o'clock in the morning, and usually the first thing you do in the day is you just read the lines um, for the director, for the crew, so they know what's happening, and so they can start to light and, and block it and everything. And Meryl starts reading, and she sounds terrible, and like, <clears throat> like can barely, you know, and I thought, oh, there'd been like a cold going around, and, I was like, this is gonna make this day so crazy, and I feel so bad for her, and you know, she's obviously really sick, and she's Meryl Streep, so she's like gonna work through it. And so we finished the rehearsal, and she's like, hey, can anybody get, grab a coffee? And I was like, oh, she was acting. <laughs> she's playing a sick person, so she was acting. But it was so real, and you don't, you know, it was like just the, the read through. Like she didn't have to, she didn't have to bring her A game, but she's not. So, <laughs> so gear shift. Um, my friends on the Instagram now. Me. Uh, you know, guys, I like to really make sure something's gonna stick. <laughs> I don't know why it took me so long, but I, there were so many fake me's that I was like, well, I'll just be me. And um, so, yeah, but I'm still, I'm not, I'm getting, I'm getting good at it. Like tonight we took a picture of our french fries. Huh? How about that for content? We're gonna do a tutorial. We're gonna sit down on these shows and we're gonna do a tutorial. Um, I, I'm uh, sure I'm not alone here, but I love it when you sing, and I wish you would sing. Which, funny, which brings us to Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Could you talk a little about that experience? First of all, I'm, I'm an okay singer. Um, don't make me talk about Dolly again. And, <laughs> and I, there are certain things I can do, but Zoe's was Zoe's was amazing. So Jane Levy is one of my best friends who has played Zoe, and um, I would do anything with her. And I thought it was really fun to play kind of somebody scary because I don't people people don't ask me to be scary that often. <laughs> um, and but you know we're doing pop music, and it, it's uh, we're doing choreography, and they push you in the sound booth, and you're like, you know, blah, 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 blah. they're like, great, bye. It was all so hard. I one of your songs. Yeah, like, one of my songs, that's why I went, blah, blah, blah. Um, I forgot what I sang, but, um, <laughs> but it was an incredible experience. It's just, it's too ambitious, uh, thing to do on network television. It's so expensive to get the music and to, do that choreography and to rehearse the way we rehearsed and Jane is like Jane could learn a dance step in four seconds and it just still was you know um, but I'm I, it's amazing that it got to exist for two seasons and that's what I love it's what what, what I love is just variety when we get to do something kind of daring and it didn't work but oh well you know it was a great experience if you couldn't be an actor or a writer anymore what would you do it doesn't even have to be for a job, just like, what would you do? Renovate houses, I guess. <laughs> I, I, well, I knew that, but I just wanted them to know. <laughs> I have a problem, which is, I drive down the street, and I'm like, gosh, that would be so pretty if, like, blah, 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 blah. And that, which is also the song I sang on Zoe's playlist. Um, I just, I don't know, that's it, it's, it's just how my brain works. I, I, I really love to redo, redecorate and redo okay. things. You can, then you can do that. No, remember the day I tried to Yeah, I sure do. decorate your house. I have an ex-boyfriend who used to call me a book hoarder, and I thought he was the only one. And I said to this one, it's when I lived at Busy Phillips' guest house, long story. <laughs> and I said, you come over and give me some ideas, because it's a long, someone took some bookcases away, it's a long story again. And you came in, you're like, mm -mm, this all has to go. And I was like, what, you're the queen of books. And she made me get rid of a lot. But then I, I was they great. dusty and on the floor. Well, it was, it's a, here's the thing. When I moved again, I was grateful. So you were right. Wow. You know the right thing about her, she's always right. Wow. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, so let's, we have a lot of really great audience questions, oh. but here's what we're going to do, y'all. Wait, I just want to say one thing oh, okay. about DC. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you don't do your DC content in DC, where are we going to do it? We'll walk you know. <laughs> Which is where we're going next. <laughs> um, Never been. We have no Milwaukee content, by the way. We only know Laverne and Shirley, and that's it. Laverne and Shirley, which I'm sure they're going to be like, really, Laverne and Shirley? We've heard it all before. Please. <laughs> so, um, when I was in at Langley High School, home of the Langley Saxons. <laughs> um, wow, all right, okay. Um, the drinking age in Virginia was 21, and the drinking age in D.C. was 18. And so naturally, we had fake IDs, since we were actually only 15 or 16. And you could take a fake ID with a little eraser and some whiteout, and you could miraculously be 18. And the big thing then was, you just had to, the bouncers, which, how did they not see it coming? I don't know. Maybe... Laws were different then. They were just suggestions. But <laughs> everyone in the car, and we would drive in our friend Joyce Antonio's father's Mercedes. Where was he? How? Why did he let us do this? I don't know. And um, my friend uh, Virginia Rowan and Kathy Kim and I would just practice, what's your sign? Because that's what we thought the bouncers were going to ask with our fake birthday. <laughs> Which they did. It was like, okay, look, it's April 18th. Um, 19, I don't know, what year would it have been? 76, I don't know, 80, Say 98, say 98. 90, 90. <laughs> and so you're, an, you're a tourist, you're a tourist. Okay, okay, I'm gonna remember that. Okay, eight, uh, April 18th. And then we were just coming to bars. Um, this is before M Street had like anything on it except like crummy bars and like an okay pizza place. And we would just dance. That's what mainly we wanted to do. It was such a fun time actually. Um, where people just, I don't know, it was good music and we just wanted to dance and then I, who, because I skipped grade when I was little, so I was even younger than the people pretending to be 18 and I didn't have a driver's license but I also didn't really drink and so I would drive Joyce Antonio's father's Mercedes home. Good for you. That's my DC content, thank you. <laughs> to all Smithsonian's just for to do something and I got to go to the Kennedy Center and see plays and what was then the Folger Theater and I do think that massively contributed to just because I loved it it wasn't like this is good for you now we're gonna go to the you know fancy museum it just it just was truly inspiring and I think this is such a great place and if I didn't do what I do and need to live on a coast, I would so happily live here. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so we've, we've learned as we've done these shows that if you take pictures of us during curtain call, you don't clap. So we're going to do a thing now where we're going to... Wait, gonna, wait, so well, because okay, the thing okay, is, this is, is based on, I went to see, this is based on, it's for you, it's not that we need applause. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I hate went, it. I went to see Bruce Springsteen, which those tickets were so expensive, somebody Shout out for Bruce, okay. <laughs> and and it was an incredible show. The tickets, it was, they were a gift, they were so expensive and people were losing their minds at, at the end of every number. And then at the end of the show, it was silence because people were just, had, you know, Broadway they're really strict about no phones during the show. And so this was their opportunity that they had to like film him. And he like walked off to nothing. It was like he walked off to like, <laughs> My mic work needs work, but um, but so what, we're, what we've tried is for now take out your phones and we're gonna pretend that it's the end of the show. <laughs> we're gonna we're, we're gonna take your questions next, but so now you can you can get your nice end of the show shot and then we're gonna stand gonna, up though. Yeah, we're gonna do it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> don't worry, we are professionals. We're gonna do some acting. You're welcome. Yeah, and then, so that at the end you don't have to take your phones out. Okay, ready? So thanks for coming. Go through the questions from the audience. 
Um, uh, what was, we hit this, what was it like working with Kelly Bishop? It was amazing. Mir miraculous. Oh, what is your favorite snack important to you? Favorite snack? Well, nachos. Yes! yes. Uh, what, what advice would you give 16-year-old Rory in 2024? Get off your phone. <laughs> Gilmore girls. Uh, do, did you have any part in choosing those clothes or was it all done by the costume designer? Valerie! Yeah. Brenda. 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 <laughs> also Valerie. Did you like the clothes? I love the clothes. I did have input. Um, we had a really great fun costume designer, Brenda Maven, but we always talked about that everything with Lorelai like had a sense of humor to it. So like that's why I wear so many t-shirts with like dog faces on them. So it wasn't like, you know, it was not like a Sex in the City level fashion kind of uh, show, but um, yeah, we just tried to make it fun. Um, Gilmore Girls is my comfort show, which I think a lot of y'all know. <laughs> what, what is your comfort show and or movie? Oh, there's so many. There's so many things that if they're on, I just can't turn them. Um, Sex and the City is something that I just have playing on because it reminds me of a time in life and, and, uh, and it, I just think it's fun. I love anything that's like older New York um, and I'm, I'm nostalgic for all those 80s New York movies, Splash and Tootsie and When Harry Met Sally and anything that has like a yellow cab in it. And, <laughs> and then weirdly I find Godfathers 1 and 2 very sad. <laughs> story that you don't really get the first time and um yeah I find it oh, we really saw exhibit remember relaxing yeah yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow there's like literally a horse well, in there yeah. in the kitchen sorry in the kitchen in gilmore girls uh was all the food real what did it take to prep the kitchen at the inn we need melissa here for that yeah one. yeah <laughs> Um, the food is always real. There's a person whose job that is who works so hard because food under hot lights is bad. It goes, melts and does bad things. And so they have to continually replenish it. And then for a lot of Melissa's stuff at the Dragonfly, <laughs> there was a lot of fire and um, that's <laughs> dangerous. And so um, there'd be like a stunt coordinator and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's real. The the uh, paper bags are not real, which would always bug me because paper bags make so much noise that they have these like prop bags that are like plasticky and they don't roll like paper bags. And I'm like, this looks like a fake bag. Also, the babies are not real. <laughs> they're made of rubber and they're so creepy. And they're floppy. They feel like they're they're floppy. Baby. I wrote about this in the book, but it, it was like a hilarious joke people would do where because sometimes you have a real baby and then they'd swap it out for the like pretend baby and sometimes somebody would be like, oh, <laughs> drop the plastic. Don't worry, it was the plastic baby. But... I've done that. <laughs> The ice is plastic too. So oh, the ice nice. is terrible because ice also makes noise and of course melts. Yeah. And <laughs> you heard it here. And <laughs> so they're, they're rubber and they're gross. Oh, oh, oh. We're going to do a little gear shift. Oh. Um, but I think this is nice. Do you have the memory of Matthew Perry? I mean, I know you have a lot of them. So. It's still really hard to believe and. Uh, I never, he, he, while he was not technically ever a boyfriend, he was a, an almost in my life and, and a friend and a, and a constant. Like I lose touch for a year, then come back in my life. And he had just come back in my life last year. Um, and he sent me for my birthday a pickleball set. He was like really into tennis and pickleball. <laughs> with a card that said, be older. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it's just a terrible loss. And the, 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 the solace I take from having seen him and, and uh, at the time I saw him was, he was so thrilled with how uh, his book was received 
and not just because it was a huge success, but because his life's work kind of became what can I, what, how can I give back? How can I talk about the struggles I've had and hopefully help somebody else? And he really was so pleased that he felt like he, he was contributing in that way. So he was really happy. Um. Is one acting role you'd love to do that you haven't done yet? I, I, I'm going to add that part. <laughs> Veep. But they did that. <laughs> um, oh, there's so much. I mean, there's just so much. I I haven't gotten to do a play in a long time. I I'm more interested. I feel like I have had such great parts in television. I'm not sure what another one would be. Uh, I, I mean, I hope to have one, but I'm not sure. I'd love to do something with Amy again. Oh, yeah. uh, because that's just such a fun collaboration. Now it's, I guess it's less about the part and more about like, what's my day of work and, and how can I work with someone I really admire and who's fun and, you know, just wanna have, just wanna have a good time. Yeah, I understand, sister. Um, <laughs> Okay, this is good. this is a good one. Um, to me, the mochi is the most vulnerable chapter in the book. Mm. Was it difficult to write, and what and was it difficult to read for the audiobook? Yes, both. I it, my aim, or just kind of what comes out of my pen or my mind, is mostly pretty light, and I think in terms, I think more comedically in terms in more than anything tone in terms of tone. I'm like, well, that'll be funny. People might enjoy that. But I had this experience a couple of years ago and it wasn't a pandemic dog, but I had adopted a dog who, a puppy who had, all, it was a, a weird time in my life and the, the puppy ended up having all kinds of medical issues and I found a better home for her. But the process made me think about, and of course people are not dogs, but it made me think about um, my mom and kind of the choices she made, which resulted in me not really uh, spending a lot of time with her. And what it, and something about the dog and the giving up of the dog and the and the painful kind of process gave me a new insight, I guess. And it's just kind of the beginning. I feel like I just scratched the surface, and it's not even this. I wasn't sure, like. If I even kind of wanted to go there, but so my mom passed at 61, but her mom moved to 101. Wow. And so some of what I had been waiting or sitting on was I didn't want to like offend my grandmother or talk, bring things up that were sad for her. And um, so yeah, I just wrote kind of about my experience. It wasn't, you know, um, not too much about, about my mom, but yeah, it was hard and, and it's hard, it's always hard to read um, anything, I wish I were more like Barbara Streisand who apparently just like sings and goes off on her audiobook and tells stories and is like not really paying attention to what's on the page. And then I did the audiobook, um, cause I always feel like you can't do that, which of course you can, it's just you're speaking to a recording and I don't know, you can do whatever you want, I guess. But, um, I did the audiobook of Rebecca Searle's uh, One Italian Summer. I love Rebecca, she's a friend. She's got a new book out called Expiration Dates. Um, and I said yes before I knew what that was about. And that is straight up about a woman losing her mother to cancer. And it's, that's in the beginning, I'm not giving anything away. And, and, it's, and it's, it's like the emotion of all of that, that you know, I, and that, was a day where I thought, I'm gonna have to go home. Like, I can't, you know? Because, and I think probably even more so because it was somebody else's writing and somebody else's story, um, somebody else's fiction. And, but, you know, you kind of have to, you gotta never let them see you sweat. You gotta, you gotta pull it together. Well, while we're on it, but anything else you're reading now you, you, you'd like to talk about? Or what are you reading now? I just, oh, a couple things. I just finished this book, The Bee Sting, which is like, yes, the author's here. And um, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. It's a dysfunctional family in Ireland uh, around the crash of one of the many, like 2008, I guess. And it's just, it's written in a fascinating, there's, 
he switches between characters, and each character has almost a different language, almost a different, totally different voice. Um, the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store is fantastic um, by James McBride, and then I just read, oh, uh, Tana French, also Irish. She, it's, it, it's The Hunter, what's the new one? The Hunter or The Searcher? They're all the something, but it's the new one. And um, yeah, I just love, I, I'll read anything. You will, you're a really good reader. I don't know how you do it. She reads and writes. Um, yeah. Can you believe it? <laughs> you always finish a book and I'm like, oh, I'm still paging through when I started the Christmas. I read quickly. I guess I read quickly and I talk quickly, but I write real slow. <laughs> Amy Barber's book for Christmas, and I did get through that. Yes. And did did you listen to it? it? I'm starting to listen to it. She's yeah. like, uh, there's a Everybody lot of Everybody talks, I can't listen to a book. I've never listened to one. People talk too slowly for me. <laughs> Even I know you can speed it up, but then they sound weird. Or, uh, she I always know. remembers what she ate and what she wore. I'll tell you that. Much. Yes, which I don't remember either thing. She's always like, there I was in my Elmer, Elmer, <laughs> green velvet. I'm like, what? And she has them in her house. She has them in like cold storage or something. Yeah. Um, this is, I like this one, Bad Santa. Get ready, sister. Bad Santa is a Christmas uh, classic. Uh, <laughs> not if you're my dad. <laughs> <laughs> right up there with Die Hard and It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't sign their name, P.S. Uh, was, uh -oh. was Billy Bob Thornton really drunk in some scenes? <laughs> fantastic actor. He, um, he apparently watched Bad Santa.